Well, good morning. I'm glad to see you. Bob and Mary, you guys do such a great job making sure everybody gets a bulletin and gets greeted. And I just want to thank you. And we appreciate all you do. And Mary, we especially appreciate you putting up with Bob. And so there is that. Uh, So, you know, what's the point of that clip? Here it is. We focus on the wrong things when it comes to the end times. Um, This sermon is called In the End. And uh, we actually, uh, so there's several times of year that I do planning. I do planning at the beginning of the year for usually about February through summer. And then typically uh, near the beginning of summer, I plan the rest of the year through January. And so this sermon uh, series was planned months and months ago, um, back when it was 143 degrees outside. Um, it's only 100 now. And, um, and yet today, not having any idea about what would be happening in the world, we talk about uh, in the end. And um, when we were on our trip, I had somebody tell me that they listened to a pastor who told them that he knew Jesus wasn't coming back in our lifetime. And I said, well, well, how does he know that? Oh, well, he just knows. I said, well, gosh, he's smarter than anybody for the last 2,000 years, I guess, including Jesus, who said we wouldn't know. And the truth is, we, you ready for this? We don't know. And so some of what I'm going to talk about today, the truth is that we don't know. But I want to tell you a story, and it made such an impact last night that I decided... Uh, to kind of move it around. And here it is. Years ago, my mom lived on a lake over in Sebring. And she sold the house because she knew I liked it. But um, (laughs) did I say that out loud? That part meant to stay inside. But she lived on a lake. It was awesome. I had a John boat there. I would just drag the John boat out to the lake and put my little trolling motor on it. John boat went about a third of a mile an hour, you know. It only did that when I did this. It pretty much did this. But it was awesome because I could get kind of in the corners and fish. So one night, it was a little later at night, I went out fishing. I went down the lake just a little bit. was in some reeds. And it was like every time I cast that worm, I I pulled up a... Dave, you would have loved it. Every time. What's your website? Your, Your YouTube channel? Yakin and Bassin, if you want a, a good fishing uh, YouTube channel by one of our guys there, it's awesome. Anyway, so um, anyway, so I was fishing down there in the corner, and all of a sudden, I, you know, I was so busy fishing that I did not notice that the clouds were building. Before I knew it, before the storm got there, the wind started blowing the boat into the reeds and the alligators, and I went full energy with that motor and I just sat there and it pushed me in the weeds so I had an oar too so I had the motor and the oar and nowhere I was going no I was stuck and I'm thinking the alligators are going to come and eat me this is going to be the end of my life or I'm going to get struck by lightning in a minute one of the two is going to kill me and I didn't know what I was going to do and I was starting to freak You got something more important going on? I'm just messing with you. That's my brother-in-law. I'm just giving him a hard time. Anyway, so I'm in the, I'm in the middle of, I'm, in the, I'm in, the, in, the, in the lake, freaking out, and I don't know what to do. And I, I've got that motor, wee, to all 12 volts, you know. I'm paddling. Nothing is changing. All of a sudden, my brother-in-law, Joe, hero of the world, I look over and he is on his jet ski coming towards me at like, I don't know, how fast is he? 35? Just a thousand. He's flying, pastorally speaking, a thousand miles an hour. He's flying at me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, can I tell you that as soon as I saw him coming my way, I thought, I am rescued. He is going to save me. And sure enough, man, he comes, he takes a rope and he throws me the end of the rope and I hang on to it, and I put my knees under the front of the John boat, and he ties the rope on the back of that jet ski, and I'm on the the front of this John boat. Now, just picture this, and he takes off, and I got my knees under the boat, and we are hauling that boat. I'm telling you, if that boat could have spoken, it would have been like, this is the best day of my life. 
because that boat was skipping through the wall. And we're flying home. And can I tell you, at that point, I could care less about the reeds. I could care less about the alligators. I could even care less about the storm because I was on my way home and I was rescued and all I had to do was hang on. And I was hanging on and I can't imagine what it looked like. Somebody watching because here is a jet ski with a big John boat just being dragged with this fat guy on the front. It's hey God, let's go. Man, it would have been a great TikTok. Now here's the truth about life. When we talk about the end times, if we're not careful, Jesus has come to rescue us. And what we really need to do is hold on to the rope. But we're still worried about the alligators. We're still worried about the reeds. and Not that all that stuff isn't still there. But the truth is, what really matters is that if you're a Christian, you're going to be rescued. If you're a Christian, no matter what happens in life and no matter what occurs in your life and no matter what goes on, good or bad, sometimes all you can do is just hold on to Jesus and know that he's going to rescue you short term or long term. Even if, listen, even if this life doesn't work out the way you want it to, we know that he has eternity in his hands. We just have to hold on. And so today when I look at this idea and what Daniel's looking at, this idea of the end times and in his life also seeing the downfall of Jerusalem and what has already happened in his life, but he's also picturing what may be happening at the end of times. And yet we understand that the big deal is not about all the things that we see. It's about who we're holding on to. So if you miss everything else in this sermon and you get caught up in some of the Side notes here, I want to encourage you to hold on. Whatever's going on in your life, just hold on. The rescue's coming. Today I want to talk about how to prepare for the end times. And I'm going to give you three ideas, and this is the very practical ideas. Pray for mercy. Pray knowing that you're in a battle. The enemy always wants to distract you with things that don't matter. And then focus on deliverance. So here we go. Number one. Pray for God's mercy on us. So with that thought in mind, I want, you, I want to stop right where we're at um, and just take a moment to pray for Israel and everything happening over there. There are innocent people um, suffering. There are people who are struggling. And I got to, if you, if you want some insight on Israel, you can talk to, I hope it's okay that I said that, you can talk to Marcus and Laura Um, They served in Israel for several years. Just a few years ago, they still have many friends over there. And they will tell you, you you, you don't have to worry about the news or anybody else. You can go talk to them and ask them who they've talked to. And they'll be glad to tell you about what's happening over there. Share prayer requests. And so I would like you to just join me as we pray for Israel today. Would you join me? Father, so many times we are, if we're honest, we admit we don't have the answers Lord, many times we have more questions than answers. But Father, we know that in the end we pray your kingdom come. But Lord, we pray like you said in your word for the peace of Israel. We know that uh, that area, that whole place is special and those people are special to you. So I want to pray your protection. And Lord, I pray your kingdom would come. Father, I pray for all innocent people on any side that you would protect them and be with them for Christians everywhere over there that they would know your strength in the middle of this. But Lord, also that you would bring peace. You said that we can pray for peace. So that's what we pray. Lord, we join together today as a church and we pray for peace for Israel. We pray all these things together in Jesus name. Amen. So Daniel's about 80 years old. He's done the lion's den thing. He's seen Rackshack and Benny thrown into the furnace. I know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's been taken from king to king, told not to pray, told what to do, bossed around, been put in charge, been promoted, demoted, given a Mr. T starter kit. You know, hey, thanks for interpreting the dream. Now you're third in the kingdom. That night the kingdom's destroyed. I mean, he's seen everything. 
And he's reading in Jeremiah, and as he reads in Jeremiah, he realizes, hey, this is about the time that we're supposed to be restored and, and go back to Jerusalem. But why aren't we? And so he starts to not only look at what's happening around him with his people, he starts to look in the mirror, and here's what he prays. Now, God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. By the way, that word for desolate is exactly from Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 10. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open our eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. Does this sound like a prayer we could pray today? We don't make requests because we're righteous, but because of your great mercy. By the way, if anybody deserved to say that they were righteous, if Daniel was here today, he would be the most spiritual person in this room. We, we've not faced anything like Daniel faced. And yet Daniel said, God, I need your grace. God, I need your mercy. So all of us should pray that. God, we need your grace. We need your mercy. And then it continues. But because of your great mercy, Lord, listen. Lord, listen forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Months ago when we planned this sermon, we had no idea what would be happening in Israel. And yet this is a prayer you could pray this very day. Let me ask you this question. When's the last time you got on your knees to pray? Now I hear you. Some of you can't. I, I understand that some of you can't. You broke your knees, did something. But when's the last time in your heart that you humbled yourself before you prayed? You said, God, I'm really not worthy to pray to you, but I know because of your mercy I can. Because of your grace. Do you realize how gracious God is and how good he is to us even though we don't deserve it? When Jesus talked about praying and he talked about the prayers that matter and the prayer that God heals, hears over and over, he talks about humility. He talked about the, the guy who stood in the temple and said, God, thank you that I'm not like that other guy. And yet Daniel said, I'm one of them. The people he was under, the Medes and Persians, were awful people. Daniel would have had an easy time going, God, thank you that I'm not like the Medes and the Persians. But instead he said, God, you know my sin. You know the sins of my people. Lord, forgive because you're gracious. When's the last time you said, God, forgive? In 2 Chronicles, when Solomon was building the temple, it was an exciting time. Can you imagine how awesome it was and just everything that was going on? And yet God warned him not to get away from God. And if he did, that he'd close the windows of heaven, that rain would quit coming, that suffering and Troubled times would come. And then God says this to him. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. By the way, seek his face, not his hand. We, we typically pray and ask God to do stuff for us. When's the last time you prayed just to know God? God, I want to seek your face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven. will forgive their sin and will heal their Land. So not only do we pray for God's mercy on us, number two, pray knowing it's a battle. Listen, you're in a battle. Once again, the focus is not on the spiritual battle, it's on who's rescuing you. But we need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. There should be times that you're traveling or doing something that you sense a heaviness that you should be aware. I need to pray. But oftentimes, we're not aware of our surroundings. This week, I was driving to Orlando on 408, such an exciting toll road. And I was kind of right behind a guy, and there was traffic going past us, and I was in the right lane. I know that's a surprise to many people. And all of a sudden, the guy in front of me slowed down by about 20 miles an hour, and I thought, is there something going on? What is happening? And and so he slowed down, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And then finally, after the cars went by, I went around him. And as I looked over, he was looking down at his phone. And I got in front of him and looked in the rearview mirror, and he was swaying on the road and going slower and slower as he looked at his phone. And all I could think was, dude, you're driving. And I'm definitely an 80s child when I say, dude, driving. 
And I thought, you know, wait till a red light. I'm joking, by the way. That was good. But the truth was, he wasn't paying attention to what he's doing. And listen, if you're not careful, you go through life and you think people are your enemy. And you think that what you see is just person against person. You think what's happening in Israel is just a a physical event and you don't recognize that it's a spiritual event too. And you need to lift up those people in prayer. And when you are dealing with a problem with a family member, you're dealing with a problem with another person, you need to recognize that it is not just a physical, it can be physical, but it's not just emotional and it can be emotional. But it's also a spiritual battle. The enemy does not want you to get along with anybody. It's a miracle that we can get along at all. That's the reason the Holy Spirit is so powerful. One of the things is you can get along with people that aren't like you. That's the power of God. And we all need that. When's the last time that you recognize that that fight with that person, that difficulty that person's have, that, that person that's trapped in a habit, or a hurt, is dealing with a spiritual battle, when's the last time you prayed for them? When's the last time you said, God, if you don't intervene, nothing's going to change. But sometimes we're so busy trying to fix it. Sometimes even in our minds, right? We're having conversations that we haven't actually had with the person. You ever do that? That's always fun to wake up in the middle of the night with a conversation. I knew I should have told them. If we prayed as much as we planned... We might change the world. So Daniel has an angel and then a person that many think is Jesus come and talk to him in chapter 10. And here's what he says. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard and I've come in response to them. Well, that's good. He prayed and God sent an angel. That's pretty awesome. But listen to the rest of this crazy verse. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now, I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Now, this is one of the most discussed passages of the Old Testament. People do doctoral papers on this. And I've had people come to me and go, what does this mean? And here's what I say. I don't know. Because I'm brilliant, right? So I go, uh. What does it mean though? It means that there's a spiritual battle going on. And what this angel is revealing to Daniel is he's just peeling back the curtain and saying, what you didn't see is you were praying and there was a war going on and your prayers were heard and God answered your prayers. Now, let me give you a practical illustration of that. I had a guy in his 80s that came to Christ. He was mean. He was grumpy. He didn't get along with his family. And when he came to Christ, he radically changed. He reunited with family members that he had not talked to in 20 and 30 years. The expression, the look on his face changed. He became a different person. I'll never forget it. And one day I was talking to him and he said, my mom's prayers were answered. But she didn't see her prayers answered till she was in heaven. I mean, the guy was in his 80s. When he said, my mom's prayers were answered, he wasn't talking about like she's in Atlanta. He knew that prayers she had prayed 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 70 years before had finally been answered. Why? Because there was a battle taking place. There's always a battle taking place. And one of the reasons that you need to continue to pray, and that's the point of this verse, that we continue to pray, we continue to knock, we continue to seek, is because we don't know what's happening under the surface. You ever met somebody and you think they will never pull out of their alcoholism, they will never pull out of their drug addiction, they will never pull out of their habit, they'll always be that way. And yet, if you begin praying for them, God may already be working under the surface, and there may be something going on that you don't even see, And maybe you're starting to give up hope, but God hasn't. God, would you send more angels? 
God, would you send your presence, your power, your peace? God, would you change that circumstance? By the way, the other thing I've noticed when I pray is even when God doesn't change that other person, you know who he changes? Me. I'll never forget, I had a student in one of my classes when I first was substitute teaching, and this student was terrible. I don't know a nicer way to say it. Awful. If I could really tell you real words, we couldn't use them in church. Just an awful kid. And I remember talking to one of my professors and saying, this kid is just every day, just this is what they're doing, this is what they're doing. They said, well, tomorrow when you get to school, I want you to sit in that kid's chair and I want you to pray for them. Okay. And I went and prayed for them. And that kid was perfect that day. No. (laughs) But my attitude towards them changed. Because I realized there was something bigger going on than just that kid having a hard time. There was something bigger going on and it was a spiritual battle. And I needed to make sure that I was addressing them with the love of Jesus Christ and the truth. But also allowing God to fight the battles that only he could fight. And it wasn't my job to fight those battles. For our struggle, Ephesians 5.12 is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And let me tell you something. Most of that takes place right here. Most of your spiritual warfare is going to take place in your mind. It's the way you think about things. It's the way you focus on things. It's how you view things. It's how you view people. And we have to pray, God, would you give me insight? God, would you clear my thinking? Lord, when I begin to get negative and complaining and grumbling, would you help me to be thankful and grateful and worshipful? Because the only way you win spiritual battles is when you begin by saying, God, I need you. God, I need your grace. Number three, focus on deliverance and power. Focus on deliverance and power. Why? Because life changes like that. This week I was coming home. I went down a side road that I always go down. As I went down the side road, there was a little Honda there who had all the airbags deployed. Yes. The guy was standing in front of it on the phone. He apparently rear-ended a trailer because he wasn't paying attention for one second and maybe slid into him. I don't know exactly what happened, but I knew that that guy left home that morning going, la, 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 la. Oh, and isn't that life? Everything's going just fine, and then everything changes. And that's why we need to understand that we are in a battle, but God brings us deliverance. And the reason that's important is because when things change, if you're not paying attention and holding on to the rope, you'll be frustrated and aggravated and upset and despairing and thinking it's never enough and always in anguish. Seeing all the negative and all the wrong things. But when you hang on to God, you know that there's bigger things coming. Listen to what Daniel says. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations till then. And by the way, that's what everybody focuses on, right? But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life will be, excuse me, in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. I think that's the internet, but anyway. I didn't say wisdom. What's the main focus of that? All the bad things that are going to happen? No, the deliverance. If we're not careful, just like Adrian Monk, we will focus on the wrong thing. The truth is, if you're not careful, you'll focus on the reeds and the alligators and everything that can go wrong when all you need to do is hold on to the rope. Can I tell you, when my brother-in-law Joe started pulling me and that boat started going forward, I'm sure if you had looked, I would have gone from this look to this look. 
And too many of us call ourselves Christians and we're hanging onto the rope. But if we're honest, we're like this. Look at all that wrong, bad stuff that's happening. Did you not notice who's pulling you? He pulls you home. One way or the other. Whether this life frustrates you your whole life or whether everything goes great, guess what? You get pulled home either way. So just keep holding on. Jesus said this when his app was working. All right, here we go. Matthew 24, 6 through 8. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Gosh, this sounds familiar. But see to it that you are not alarmed. How you doing? You've been watching too much news? <clears throat> we read that one again. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Why? Because they make money when they freak you out. Because you'll watch more news. You'll just keep watching it. You'll just keep watching the same thing over and over again because you're freaked out. Do not be alarmed. Why does Jesus say that? Because he knew you'd be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. And then he says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. They might even be fake birth pains. Don't women have fake birth pains before real birth pains? It's not fair, is it? And so what Jesus is saying is, there's going to be all kinds of things like this. Don't be alarmed. And then I love what Jesus says to his disciples before he leaves. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what's Jesus saying to his disciples? Don't worry so much about the when. Just be empowered and be witnesses. Just hold on. Show other people that God loves them too. Maybe this is the end. If it's the end, you know what you should do? Hold on. If this is not the end, you know what you should do? Hold on. Jesus says, just the Holy Spirit's going to empower you. Guess what? When you're walking in the Holy Spirit, you'll know what to do with what happens next. And all you got to do is hang on. I know you think you have to figure it all out. I know something inside of you says, if I could only know what's going to happen next. Listen, that guy did not know he was going to get in a car accident. You don't know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, the next day. And if you did, you wouldn't like it anyway. So just hold on. I don't know your future. But I know if you hold on to him, we'll have a future together in eternity with more joy, more peace than we've ever felt. All that pain that you feel in the morning when you get up and make a lot of noise. Oh, my kids will say across the house sometimes, what was that noise? Just me getting up. That's what I do now. Ah! Am I the only one? No. no, okay, thank you. A lot of old people in here. Thank you so much. Right? <laughs> Sorry, was that painful? Was that painful? Sorry. Can I tell you what to do? Hold on. Because if you know Jesus and you love Jesus, a thousand years from now, we'll all be worshiping together with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more goodbyes, no more suffering, no more weakness. Hold on to him. I wish I, could, I wish I could just give you this rope and it would work for you to do that. But if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to holding on to him is surrendering to him. The Christian life literally is the idea of surrender. I surrender my sin to his. I surrender my way of doing things to his way of doing things. I surrender my sin knowing that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. And God, I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you the rest of my life. When you surrender your life to him, that's what it means to become a Christian. To understand that Jesus died and rose again because we need him. Just like Daniel needed him, we need him. So if you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. If you're here today and you're already a Christian, but the truth is you've been holding on to a lot of stuff. 
Or maybe you're holding on and looking around all the time and you've become alarmed. Maybe it's time to surrender that too. God, would you refocus me on you? Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Father, I thank you for the example of Daniel who showed us that, Lord, no matter what's happening, we need your mercy, we need your grace, we need your love. Lord, may we walk in that today. Father, thank you for each one here. I pray for that one today who just needs to know that you're with them, that they would know that. That, Father, you would speak to them and give them your strength in the middle of a struggle. Father, for that one today who's been focused on everything except the rescue, that today they would know that you are always with them. You will never leave them or forsake them. Lord, your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our offering now. Our